song we'll be singing is Drummy Clubs. Thank you all for coming out today and singing. Um, that was it was beautiful. It was beautiful, and now we will hear a word from the Lord through Dr. Hybert Williams. Thank you very much, Pastor T. It's good to see you on the outdoors. Are are the mosquitoes um, resting and having a Sabbath day rest? Uh, yes. No, no mosquitoes up here at all. Oh, because you're in La La Land, there are no mosquitoes there. Okay, the I get it. Sea breeze yes. blows them away. Yeah, they're just in the valley with the heat with us. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. I am so excited to see almost 50 people worshiping with us this morning. You know, if you count by the number of that shows on your screen of participants, you'll miss the point that there are almost 50 people in all of these um, thumbnails worshiping with us this morning. And I am so happy 
to be able to welcome you. So what I want you to do is to gather yourselves and come a little bit closer because I want to talk to you. I, I want to talk about something that is a taboo. So you've got to keep it to yourselves, okay? So just come a little bit closer. And let me tell you what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about clothes. Yesterday, as I walked into Miss Ella's room, I heard Medea, Tyler, Tyler Perry's alter ego, say this. She said, clothes don't make a person pretty. They make you broke. I thought that was a reality moment. And just this week, I read what Khalil Gibran, the 20th century Lebanese-American poet and author of The Prophet, one of the best-selling books of all time. If you've never read it, get it and read it. He sets us straight in his poem. This is what he wrote. And his poem is entitled, On Clothes. And the weaver said, speak to us of clothes. And he answered, your clothes conceal much of your beauty, yet they hide not the unbeautiful. And though you seek in garments the freedom of privacy, you may find in them a harness and a chain. Would that you could meet the sun and the wind with more of your skin and less of your raiment. For the breath of life is in the sunlight and the hand of life is in the wind. Some of you say, it is the north wind who has woven the clothes we wear. And I say, I, it was the north wind, but shame was his loom and the softening of the sinews was his thread. And when his work was done, he laughed in the forest. Forget not the modesty, forget not that modesty is for a shield against the eye of the unclean. And when the unclean shall be no more, what were modesty but a fetter and a fouling of the mind? And forget not that the earth delights to feel your bare feet and the winds long to play with your hair. So wrote Khalil Gibran. Clothes, you see. Clothes. Love them or hate them, we must have them. They are so significant, we wrap babies born naked and free in clothes. Then... As they grow, we teach them tricks of the trade, such as using clothes to conceal or sin or reveal shame of the shame of others. So important are clothes to humans. The world's economy depends on the making, selling, and buying of them. In fact, from the beginning of creation to the present time, the covering provided by clothes more than fashion, have been very important to both God and human beings. For example, Psalm 93 verse 1 declares that the Lord is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. You see, clothes represent more than superficial covering which adorn and enhance the image of the person wearing them. Every day we put on clothes and take them off without realizing that they reveal or conceal our true identity. They reveal or reflect our attitude toward those with whom we associate and indicate the value we place on ourselves and others. It's therefore no secret or breaking news that we judge ourselves based on clothes, and we judge others based on their choice or lack of clothing. And we judge them on these things, especially in the first few minutes of meeting them. Clothes make the man. 
Naked people have little or no influence on society. So said Mark Twain. And many studies called enclothed cognition tend to affirm Twain's opinion of clothes that naked people make no impact on society because clothes makes all the difference. They close show that the, these studies called enclothed, con, co, enclothed cognition show that the clothes we wear can affect our mental as well as physical performance. These studies also suggest that there is something biological happening when we put on a snazzy outfit and feel like a new person. We see that all the time on television with these extreme makeovers. Someone is dull and, and, and tired looking and we put them in new clothes and they tend to bloom as if never before. On the other hand, if we want to be a big ideas person at work, we suit up because it's believed that wearing formal business attire increases abstract thinking and other important aspects of creativity, long-term strategizing, and feelings of power. So says these studies. If you've ever watched the rehearsal process of a professional play, you know just how powerful clothes are. Even in the very early stages of a project, professional actors will come to practice in certain pieces of clothing that make them feel more like their character and help them get just the right swagger, grace, or edge. A few weeks later, when they're closer to opening, they'll have an actual dress rehearsal with their real costumes. It's pretty amazing to see how the right clothes bring the performances up to a whole new level and transform the actor into the character. There's power in clothing. Do you want to prove there's power in clothing? Do you want to prove that an incredible outfit increases confidence and adds validity to your brand? Just recall how you perform your job better or feel more empowered based on what you are wearing. Just think of how first impressions of you are more positive when you are well-dressed for the right occasion. And you don't have to spend lots of money to look good. Smart dressers, no consignment shops, where rich folks recycle expensive clothes and we can buy them for less. Many stories in the Bible confirm that clothing can greatly influence first impressions and make a lasting impact on anyone with whom you interact. Like it or not, people judge each other on how one looks and will make both conscious and subconscious decisions about another person on what that person is wearing or not wearing. Yet, some men and women who belong to a conservative Christian community of faith tend to preach that clothes don't matter, and, and there are others who condemn interest in clothes as worldliness. Others of a more liberal climb devalue the importance of dressing well or appropriately and denounce dressing up for church as a sign of self-absorption. But truth is, we can actually learn a lot about ourselves by considering the clothes we choose and wear because, like it or not, our clothes communicate volumes about us as a person and more than anything, deep down inside, we know that this is true. Therefore, the question isn't whether we care about fashion. It's more about what we're intentionally or unconsciously communicating to others through our clothing on any given occasion. Is what we choose to wear, especially to church, concealing sin or revealing shame? 
For just as the actor in the right costume moves and differently, so every person depends on depends on what they are wearing to conceal naked truths or cover open shame. Like it or not, admit or reject it if you will, our clothes tell true stories about us. For example, pastors are trained to think if we want to show that our presentation is clear, sharp, and to the point, we are to dress in clean lines, conservative colors, and yes, pay a lot of attention to hair and shoes. They say even the kind of eyeglasses and the way that we wear them speaks volumes about us and our profession. To make this idea stick, powerful people picked uniforms for others to wear, such as black suits for preachers, white coats for physicians, lab coats for technicians, and t-shirts with ID labels and company logos to immediately identify the positions we hold and the authority we exercise. Clothes matter. Clothes are also important to God, but for different reasons. God is pictured in scripture as covering himself with divine light in order to create the world. And only after he said, let there be light, which illuminated the world like a garment, perhaps the, which was perhaps the luster of his majesty, only after that did he actually begin to create the world and all that is in it. In effect, the act of creation was God covering the entire world with a tent-like garment of light, and all the world, including the first human beings, were wearers of that divine radiance. This also points to the fact that the first couple were the first and only originally created children of God. All others thereafter were not made by the hand of our divine creator and redeemer, but were born of blood, born of the will of the flesh and the will of man before being born again and becoming children of God to whom he personally gave birth, according to John chapter 1, verse 12. Additionally, when it comes to God, Psalm 104, when it comes to God and close, Psalm 104, verse 1, declares that God is clothed with splendor and majesty. Isaiah 59, verse 17, asserts that God puts on righteousness like a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head, garments of vengeance for clothing, and wraps himself with zeal as a mantle. Biblical writers also used images of clothes to illustrate their divinely directed visions and lessons. For instance, white robes and royal vestments are used to communicate holy and righteous acts of the saints, while tattered, filthy clothing symbolize the sinfulness of individuals and nations who refuse to obey God's commandments. The prophet Isaiah, for example, railed against his opponents saying, they will wear out like a garment, the moth consuming them. And in that's in chapter 50, verse nine. And similarly, in Jeremiah 13, verses one through 11, the prophet was divinely instructed to buy a beautiful linen loincloth and adorn it himself and, and, and then wear it. Then he was instructed to take it off after wearing it for a while. He was instructed to take it off, bury it, and then dig it up later. But when he dug up the loincloth, it was ruined with stains and dirt. You see, God used this to illustrate that as the loincloth clung close to the prophet's body, like underwear, so he brought Israel close to himself. But they would not obey him, 
preferring to serve other gods. And so, like the soil loincloth, God would do likewise to the errant people of Israel and Judah, and their land would lie in ruins as they would be exiled to Babylon. So clothes are used sometimes to uplift and also to judge and execute judgment. In the same vein, on the other hand, according to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, the prophet predicted that Israel, which was then in exile in Babylon, would be forgiven for its sins and would return from exile. And to illustrate this, he painted a portrait of a high priest named Joshua, the Hebrew of the Greek, Jesus. And this name, Joshua, or Jesus, means Yahweh is salvation. And here is how he's going to prove that Yahweh is salvation and that the people of Israel in exile would be released to return to their homeland. This high priest in this story was described as clothed in filthy garments indicating the presence of sin. And not just a little sin, but lots of big sin. And this, this, this sin was caused by disobedience and shame. But God ordered the removal of those filthy rags and replaced them with new priestly robes, symbolic of God's amazing grace and forgiveness. In scripture, you see, changes in the style or type of clothing can also communicate the different stages of an individual's life, whether it's ascending to greater heights with God or descending into the pits of iniquity. For instance, the removal of that high priest's filthy garments symbolized forgiveness of sin and freedom from shame. But when Adam and Eve made themselves and put on garments of fig leaves, their action represented attempts to conceal their sin and to cover their shame. So far, we've discovered that God is portrayed in the Bible as wearing several different garments, some interchangeably from the creation of the world to the present day. These garments that God is described as wearing include seven specific garments such as majesty, strength, vengeance, zeal, righteousness, compassion, and purity. And many individual verses also describe God as wearing other qualities. But in the last days, he's pictured as a bridegroom adorned with a royal diadem in Isaiah 61 verse 10. And his bride, the church, is decked out in fine linen, bright and clean, which is the righteous acts of the saints, according to Revelation 19, verse 7. Because of the importance of clothing in Scripture, because it is so noticeable in Scripture that clothing is significant, we are starting a five-part series called Clothes in the Bible. And by launching part of this series entitled Close, Concealing Sin, Revealing Shame, we are seeking answers to the significance of clothing in Scripture and in the human experience. So please join me as I read again, more for the audience that will see us on YouTube or in the watch party later, as I read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Please open your Bibles as I read from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And as Pastor Sean read from the New American Standard Bible, I will follow in his footsteps. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. 
but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Although I can't hear you, I just want you to read with me verse seven. So just take your Bible and read out loud in the company of your family, verse seven with me. Ready? Here we go. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now I could see your lips moving, so I know that you were reading, some of you. Note that in, in verse 7, it is reported that the first clothing or covering made by humans, that the first clothing or covering made by humans themselves re refers to material covering, but it's also a metaphor for concealing sin and revealing shame. It's further noteworthy that before they disobeyed God, especially his specific command, Adam and Eve were both naked and were not ashamed, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. They were both naked and not ashamed. You see, that nakedness wasn't just the lack of material garments, but it indicated the lack of a hidden agenda. They had no thoughts or secrets that they couldn't share with each other because they were clothed in the divine garments of purity and sinlessness. Those garments made it impossible for them to see their shortcomings, particularly through the brilliant lens of purity and the clothing of divine radiance. And even if they could see beneath the surface, because there was no sin to mar their perceptions, as we have to deal with today, they saw only the beauty and goodness of each other. However, the moment they transgressed God's command not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the moment they did eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the protective covering or righteous robe of light disappeared. And immediately, they began to see through a glass or lens darkly and became aware of their nakedness and faults. We're told that their eyes were opened and they saw each other as if for the first time, which made them realize two things, fear and shame, which were unknown to them up until that time. But suddenly, they became afraid of God and ashamed of each other, indicating the loss of innocence which they traded for knowing and seeing good and evil. They lost their oneness with the divine and in the process, their own sense of unity, purity, and beauty. They were forced to recognize their essential stark differences and had to relate to each other in a wholly different manner for their loss caused each one of them to feel embarrassed, vulnerable, and shamed. And on that day, they exchanged the garment that God made for them and the wholeness it brought for something 
they fashioned for themselves to cover their sin and shame. You know, today we're still covering our sin and shame. It's called um, autosoterism. That word means that we are trying to save ourselves. We're covering and trying to save ourselves. So as they stood facing each other for the very first time, without the garment God made for them, they were astonished by how their bodies were shaped. Adam recognized his maleness and Eve her femaleness, and instinctively they felt ashamed and hid themselves from God and each other with coverings of fig leaves for protection. You know, they chose fig leaves for, those, for these reasons. It was a familiar fruit from which they often ate. Its leaves were large with tiny hairs that became a great protection from the climate which had suddenly turned torrid in Eden. So Adam and Eve sewed together their own fig leaves into loincloths to gird themselves. And instantly we realize that instantly helping each other became a thing of the past as they literally girded their own loins or private parts, which is described in scripture as being so delicate, we cover them with two and three layers of clothing to protect their privacy. The actions of Adam and Eve prompt me to reflect on the garments we women instinctively use to protect and perhaps insulate ourselves from our own past or our own actions or shaming per perpetrated through misogynistic church politics. But we won't go there. That's another sermon. From that day in Eden, when God confronted the couple with a harsh judgment, whenever human beings are judged or criticized, we automatically feel like Adam and Eve, uncomfortable, awkward, almost as if we're naked, vulnerable, deprived of our humanity, and, and stripped of garments that cover or enhance our image, we feel naked. And because the deep raw feelings are known to others, others know that we feel like this when we're stripped of our material clothing, if not spiritual, evil men and women use clothes deprivation as a punishment to break the will of their captives. Such a deprivation occurred during the Holocaust when the Nazis forced Jews to strip naked in many public contexts, but especially in the concentration camps. American slave traders traveled over land and sea to capture Africans whom they stripped of all their clothing, abused them in the most inhum in inhumane ways, and left them bereft of dignity to make in order to make themselves rich. That treatment was more destructive and devastating than even stealing them from their family and native land because it demoralized the captives, made them lose their dignity, and become easy prey to rule to be ruled over with fear and cruelty. Thus, the captors succeeded in dehuman, dehumanizing and lording it over their captives. I shouldn't use big words I can't pronounce, but here we go. This is a teaching moment for all of us. The, the captives succeeded in dehumanizing and lording it over their captives by stripping them of their clothing and forcing them to be naked, demonstrating that in their eyes, captives, slaves, were less than or not even considered to be human. In the Bible, nakedness is also symbolic of sinfulness and myriad prophetic texts utilize the image of the stripping of garments as a way of revealing a person's sinful and shameful acts. In fact, one of the most oft used phrases by the prophets is the uncovering of one's nakedness, which underscores this symbolism. For example, the typical wording in Ezekiel 16 verses 36 through 39, where it is written, thus said the Lord God, 
because of your brazen effrontery, offering your nakedness to your lovers for harlotry, I will expose your nakedness and all shall see it. They shall strip you of your clothing and take away your dazzling jewelry, leaving you naked and bare. You see, uncovering people's nakedness by removing their clothing also revealed their sin and shame. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 3, verse 18 through 24, the prophet Isaiah poetically captures this power in the case of the daughters of Zion, of whom he wrote, In that day, Adonai will strip off the finery of the anklets, the skins and the crescents, the bracelets and the veils, the turbans, the amulets and the sashes, the festive robes, the mantles and the shawls, the lace gowns and the linen vests and the kerchiefs and the capes. And then instead of perfume, there shall be rot. And instead of an apron, a rope. Instead of a diadem of beaten work, a shorn head. Instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth, a burn instead of beauty. And I don't want you to miss how without the use of a single verb in this final verse, but with the stark repetition of the word instead, we feel the deprivation, the loss of dignity, the humiliating barrenness, sin and, sh and the sin and shame of the once proud, wealthy, privileged, and extravagantly dressed sinners. And I'm telling you something, those who mistreat the children of God in this life, that's what's reserved for them in the next. Though far removed from the Garden of Eden and the centuries when Israel was exiled from the Promised Land, we understand that occasionally our actions uncover our core carnal or sinful nature, thereby impelling us to see ourselves for what we truly are. We, like Adam and Eve, recognize our own imperfections. And if we're honest, this can be truly devastating to ourselves and shocking to others. In response to such a stark reality, some become suicidal. A few repent and reunite with God in a deeper relationship. But there are those who shake their fists at God and blame him for their self-inflicted dilemma. It is ultimately impossible for true Christians to mask self-knowledge or cover the raw truth of who we are with clothing because we are left with the haunting question of how can we, as children of God, live with such deep feelings of vulnerability and shame? The Bible has several examples in which individuals who felt vulnerable covered themselves as a means of protection. For example, when Rebekah first laid eyes upon Isaac, she was so overcome by his appearance and filled with feelings of astonishment, awe, and vulnerability that she was overwhelmed and fell off the camel onto the ground, fell off the camel on which she was riding, according to the story in Genesis 26. It is almost as if she could not bear to look at him, and she immediately took her veil and covered herself. She instinctively knew that she needed to protect herself in his presence because it felt as if he could see through her. In reflecting on this incident, perhaps we should consider those moments in which we have felt the most vulnerable as we face the other in our lives, be it God, individuals with whom we interact, or critical members of our congregations. And when we interact with them, we feel as if they are seeing through us. Dare we ask what we might have done on those occasions that made us feel so vulnerable and ashamed to the point of not being able to look others in the face? Why do we feel it's necessary or it's our responsibility to conceal our nakedness instead of confronting our shame? If clothing is indicative of inner character, how can we by ourselves transform the reminders and the memories of past sin or shame into current garments of godly self-confidence that can adorn and sustain us regardless of the persons or positions encountered? Here are 
a few recommendations. These are my recommendations. First, concealing sin, the source of shame, requires that we dress for success inside our head and heart before choosing outside garments to cover up or mask feelings of vulnerability. Let me say it again. Before we, in, before we cover our outside, we need to fix up our inside to summarize it. Brene Brown, expert on social connection and author of Dare to Leave, she said, while we may try to appear perfect, strong, or intelligent in, in order to connect with others, in reality, we fear being vulnerable because we are afraid that if someone finds out who we really are, they will reject us. We know that vulnerability does not mean being weak or submissive. To the contrary, it implies the courage to be yourself. It involves uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Although we may try to run from vulnerability, it is an inevitable part of social relationships. Even outside of romance, vulnerability is something we encounter frequently as opportunities to present themselves every day. The question is whether we will take and turn vulnerability into potential for growth and success. What will you do? Here are some divine internal garments for concealing sin and revealing shame, which God, the divine tailor, has sewn into the spiritual DNA of all who accept and believe in Jesus Christ as their personal savior. These include, but are not limited to garments called majesty, the majesty of God, you've got it. Strength, righteousness, compassion, purity of thought and action, all of these are garments God has provided for us to keep and protect us when we're feeling vulnerable. These garments, referred to in Revelation 19, 7, as fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, will cause us to embrace, not fear, but to embrace normal, natural feelings of vulnerability. My second recommendation is revealing sin and shame is the only way to overcome them. But this requires that we recognize there are two types of shame and how to handle each one of them. One type of shame is called healthy shame, which alerts us to threatening situations by exerting feelings of fight or flight. If we are feeling guilt over an act that hurt someone, that is actually healthy, the healthy version of shame because it activates our conscience and propels us to take positive action, positive redemptive action. The bad feeling is telling us that something went against our value system or core value. It's a signal to make amends and rectify the situation so that we can renew our state of well-being with God and others. And once we've forgiven if we were wrong, once we've been forgiven if we were wrong or asked for forgiveness if we were the hurtful one, healthy shame leads to repentance. The other is unhealthy shame, which, on the other hand, occurs when we allow ourselves to be defined by weakness or something over which we have no control. And it leads to remorse, not repentance, but to remorse, which always seeks and finds excuses or others to blame for that behavior. Since this tends to control us, let's discuss it in more detail. Unhealthy shame seems to control us. So let's discuss it. For instance, unhealthy shame is among the most corrosive of human emotions. And I'm sure by now you've gathered that I'm in a teaching mode. Unhealthy shame is among the most corrosive of human emotions. It has power to convince us that the little voice in our head is right. 
you know that little voice that says, I know you'd fail. You'll never really belong. You'll never really amount to anything. And who would or could ever love you? Unhealthy shame is the legacy of the original sin of Adam and Eve, which has bequeathed every human being thereafter with both a universal, excruciating feeling of unhealthy shame. Rich or poor, overweight or thin, successful or struggling, whether we admit it or not, and we usually don't admit it, we all experience unhealthy shame from time to time. It can shut us down or emerge in ways destructive to ourselves and others, such as in harsh criticism, verbal violence, passive or defensive aggression, and a multitude of behavioral disorders, including overeating, drug and alcohol addiction, depression, and bullying. And among Christians, it's, it manifests itself in prayers that people make and say things in prayers that they don't have the guts to say to your face. That's how unhealthy shame reveals itself. It's therefore crucial that we learn ways to deal with unhealthy shame and build healthy barriers against it. I found these five tips to overcome unhealthy shame in a Psychology Today article, and I'm sharing them with you in summary. The article said, bring shame into light because it's by revealing its existence that we get rid of it. Keeping secrets about shame is never going to get rid of it and it will corrode your emotions. Next, untangle what you are feeling. Dig deep and, and, and look in the mirror and admit to that what you're feeling. I'm feeling angry because this was done to me. That's okay. The Bible says be angry but don't sin, meaning don't take revenge for yourself. Leave it up to God. But anger is a gift from God to protect us from evil people and things. Next, unhitch what you do from who you are. You, we like to say, I'm a bad person. No, you're not a bad person. God never created a bad person. You may have done some bad things, but you are not a bad person. So unhitch yourself from the things that you do and, 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 and stop claiming that you are those things. You might do them because of sin. Recognize your triggers. Recognize your triggers. You know what, you know what makes you feel this unhealthy shame? You know, a look from someone like they're putting you down can trigger unhealthy shame. You know, a word that is intended to make you feel belittled can trigger unhealthy shame. You've got to know your own triggers in order that when in the trigger, when the, when the button is pushed and the trigger is about to release, you're able to call upon the name of the Lord and he will deliver you from unhealthy shame. And finally, recognize, recog we just talked about recognizing, make connections because the source of unhealthy shame is fear of disconnection used by persecutors, predators, and perpetrators of evil to hold their victim hostage. So make connections with people in the community of faith and talk real with them. You know, the other day, I shared a real thing about myself. And I was surprised how many people called me afterwards privately to say this was so helpful. Yeah, I, I, I've been diagnosed as being bipolar, but guess what? I know the triggers and now it doesn't control me. I control it. And that's what we can do about health, unhealthy shame. Unhealthy shame is causing God's people to play the ugly way we've been treated. It's a broken record of victimhood that allows someone else to play it in our presence. Unhealthy shame causes us to process pain instead of praising God for the progress we've made despite the prejudices with which we are faced. True, as humans and especially as Americans, we're, we're big brother rules 
We've been traced, we've been spaced, we've been human erased, we've been mugged, we've been bugged, we've been detected. But thank God Almighty, from Him we've never been divinely disconnected. Unhealthy shame wants us to believe we're isolated from God and conceal our beautiful, natural, God-given sense of healthy shame with sheets of complaint, criticism, carping, and comparison. But we won't let it keep on happening to us. We're facing our unhealthy shame. And we're saying to God, take it out of us. Give, we're giving it up to God. We're never going to be ruled anymore by unhealthy shame. For we know that despite our shortcomings, in Christ we are victorious. We're not victims of unhealthy shame. In Christ, we are whole and complete, not fragmented and scattered. That's why I'm not bipolar. I have been diagnosed with bipolar, but I'm not bipolar. I'm a child of God. I'm a living saint. I hold on to the holiness of Jesus Christ, and so must all of us who are struggling with unhealthy shame. It's killing the church of God. It's causing us to be overjudgmental, overcritical, over everything. So get over it. In Christ, we are saved and sanctified. And it's about time we see ourselves as chosen for such a time as this. It's about time we leave every worship experience enriched, empowered, and energized soldiers in his army who have to fight. And sometimes, yes, we have to cry. It's about time we recognize, admit, and affirm that we are divinely anointed and appointed sisters and brothers. It's time to live as those called to hold up Christ's bloodstained banner. And we will hold it up. We must hold it up. We are determined to hold it up until we die. We will not let unhealthy shame have power over us and cause us to cover sin and to be afraid of revealing our shame. I'm revealing our shame right now. We're sinners, but we're saved by grace through faith. May God bless you. Let us pray. God of our fathers and mothers, how long must we wait for these things to be clear to us so that we can live above the darkness and the stench that holds us back and cripples us? Let it be today, God. Let it be today. Let today be the day when we find freedom, true freedom in Jesus Christ from both sin and unhealthy shame. We pray this in his holy name. Amen.